Καλησπέρα σε όλου. Τον περασμένο Μάρτιο στην Ισλανδία ενεργοποιήθηκε για πρώτη φορά μετά από 200 χρόνια ένα μικρό ηφαίστειο που θα μείνει στην ιστορία για δύο λόγου. Για το δύσκολο όνομά του και για το χάο που προκάλεσε στι ευρωπαϊκέ αερομεταφορέ. Ένα μήνα αργότερα, τον Απρίλιο δηλαδή, το νέο τη ηφαιστειακή τάχτη που βγήκε από τον κρατήρα του Αίγια Φιατλαγιόκουλτ κατάφερε ότι δεν μπόρεσε να καταφέρει ο Χίτλερ στο Δεύτερο Παγκόσμιο Πόλεμο, η διεθνή τρομοκρατία στι μέρε μα και ίσω ο ιό τη Νέα Γρήπη. Απέκλεισε αεροδρόμια και ένα αέριο χώρο σε 12 χώρε, ακύρωσε περισσότερε από 100.000 πτήσει και ανάγκασε την Ευρώπη να επιστρέψει, έστω και για λίγε μέρε, σε μια εποχή δίχω αεροπλάνο. Την ώρα που οι κάμερε των Διεθνών Ειδησογραφικών Πρακτορείων εστίαζαν στι αίθουσε αναμονή και στι τεράστιε ουρέ στου σιδηροδρομικού σταθμού, εμεί αποφασίσαμε να ταξιδέψουμε στην Ισλανδία. Αυτή είναι η άγνωστη ιστορία ενό μικρού ηφαιστείου με μεγάλο αντίκτυπο στι ζωέ εκατομμυρίων ανθρώπων. Omar Ragnarsson. I am uh, principally a TV reporter, but I'm also a film editor. I have been entertainer for 50 years, longer than in the TV business. And uh, I am a commercial pilot and rally driver and some other things. But in the center is the uh, news reporter. Eyjafjallajökull is my mountain from my childhood. This beautiful volcano, so beautifully shaped, typical volcano. I was uh, found of flying from the beginning. My father, he took me into a four-passenger, small, single-engine airplane when I was just seven years old. How old are you? I'm 70, uh, next September. I always said the same thing, you know. How did you manage to fly like that? Are you afraid? Of course. There are two types of pilots. Afraid pilots and dead pilots. <laughs> Called black humor. Experience, you know. I have practiced it for uh, over 20 eruptions. And uh, the tricks is to uh, establish the airplane first. Know uh, how it will fly, uh, be sure that nobody is in my way. After that, uh, I have the camera here, and after all this here, I know exactly what, is in, what the camera is taking. So I prefer just to have the camera here in the window and steer the airplane up and down, you know, and do everything with, with my left hand and my feet, because After flying these airplanes for thousands of hours, I know exactly what they are doing. I hear the sound in the wings. I feel uh, feel the airplane completely like it was a part of my. The, the wings of the airplane were the wings of mine. We had good light. You were lucky with the light. And also, you could see down to the crater. Uh, you could see it. There was no turbulence, uh, but I think that in one or two occasions you could uh, hear this. Yeah. Yes. You that could hear the sounds. It and was see a, the explosions. Yeah, I see the explosions. I see the rocks coming up. The sound waves are going like this, pom, pom, pom. it's the speed of sound, pom, 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 pom. and it, the sound waves are taking up uh, rocks that are as big as cars, 
many hundreds of big rocks going like this. And the fire behind, and the steam white, and the ash black. You have many, many contrasts in the same place. And sun coming up on this side, and it's heaven, it's, it's snow, it's intact, beautiful nature. On the, and the up, up drift, I can cut off the engine of the airplane if I wish to, and fly like a bird uh, uh, silently. And on the other side, it's hell. It's so much darkness that the people can barely see their hands. It's complete darkness, ash falling, hell. And I think at that moment I understood better than before why uh, the Europeans in the Middle Ages uh, believed that Hekla, the mountain north of Eyjafjallajökull, uh, was the entrance to hell. And the devil himself was there down and uh, making this fire and ash and punishing the people. It's heaven and hell, it's, uh, it's brightness and darkness, and uh, it's a terrible uh, wind and a beautiful wind. It's uh, fire and ice, and in Eyjafjallajökull, it can be, everything of this can be uh, in the same area at the same time. Tuesday because of continuing in fact, all ash of Britain's airspace is, is off limits right now well, because of dangerous clouds a massive of volcanic ash. ash cloud that's brought so European air travel to a virtual Charles halt Charles has stranded an estimated 32,000 people. Says the disruption the could affect some of Britain's busiest airports in the southeast. Well, Sky's Julianne Needham is the Heathrow Airport. It's a spectacular sight, but not at 35,000 feet. Cruising altitude of commercial aircraft where it causes engines to cut out. Acts like a sandblaster. the whole day driving around waiting and then I saw the cloud in the night in the evening they went away and I was like oh, whoa what's this this is big and I was like okay this is the biggest grayish I have seen and the contrast was so big mm -hmm. then I drove closer and closer and then the gray started to be darker and darker in the end I stopped and it was just dark wall in front of me It was kind of quiet. And suddenly we realized we barely hear the sound of the car. It was kind of killing all the sound. And even there was wind, you know, the, the ash was flowing around. And, and I was like, I can't hear the wind either. But there was wind there. It was totally dark. And I only saw the light of my car. And it was a narrow, narrow beam, very narrow beam. It was weird, scary. Yes, it was, it, it's kind of freaky. So 
So at that point, we decided to go back. And and uh, it was so funny thing when we drove back. Suddenly we saw a little, little, little light. You know, bluish light in the sky, got bigger and bigger. And we drove out of this. We stopped a few times. Um, I went outside to listen to the sound, and there was no sound because the birds are not flying. The birds are sitting. They're not flying. And then I drove out of the uh, this silent, dark cloud back into the wind again. This is scary. This is scary. Because it's, it fools you a little bit. You believe, ah, this is just a fog, but it's not a fog. It's full of ice. So what we are gonna, see, what I'm gonna show you here now is I'm gonna show you how a black snow looks like. We're gonna dig into the ice until we see the snow underneath the glacier. This is the glacier. We've been trying up to the glacier. And this is what they have here. Black snow all over. Look, we can see it in here. You can see it in here. I'm gonna try to clean it a little bit. It's like a mud. You cannot clean it. This is just black snow. And they cannot operate the, the snow cats or anything from here. I've been studying this volcano for almost 20 years. In Mars, we could see how magma was making it progressively shallower in the volcano. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, this first eruption on Mars 20th, uh, and then we had the second uh, and the big explosive eruption on April 14th. We expected an eruption, but the, the scale of this eruption is, is more than we expected. gather about uh, four, four or five up cups. So we are seeing the the effect of an eruption where uh -huh. there is ice going up into the air, uh, lava flowing onto the ice, melting uh -huh. the ice, uh -huh. creating the, the big white plume. So uh -huh. there are two different types, they are uh -huh. black and white. Then. Looks uh, like a fight between fire and uh, yeah. ice. Yes, it is. <laughs> Who is winning? <laughs> the fire. The fire is winning. Yeah, at the moment. We don't see a, yet an end to this process. Mm. Um, but the ice will win in the end. We don't, just don't know when. <laughs> <laughs> The Eyjafjallajökull volcano rises up to an elevation of uh, about 1660 meters. It has a, a radius of about 15 kilometers and it's like a, a, a cone. And uh, the ice on top of Eyjafjallajökull is about uh, 200 meters thick, where it is maximum thickness.
what happened in this interaction with the ice was that the, the ass was very fine grain. So it was a special type of ass that was created in this eruption. And because it is so, so fine grain, uh, once it makes it up high into the atmosphere, it doesn't uh, fall down so easily. So they stay high up in the atmosphere. So it's a combination of eruption and the run ice, special magma composition that produces very fine grained ash mm. and the, the weather conditions. So the particles, all these small particles, they end up in the, uh, in the jets and uh, because of the high temperature there, they melt and they can destroy. Uh, mm. And that is the reason mm. why uh, airplanes were grounded. The last eruption before these was in 1821, and the next one prior to that was in 1612. The next one prior to that was 920. So it's not, a, and all these eruptions were small, so it's not a very active volcano. Uh, probably this present eruption is the biggest one it has had in a thousand years. Opposite to Aetherlea, which is, is, Katla is a very, very active volcano and, and can be very dangerous as well. Uh, it happens to be the nearest neighbor to Aetherlea, which so the distance between the two volcanoes is only 20, 25 kilometers. So whenever there is activity in Aetherlea, it seems to have an eff effect on Katla or can possibly have an effect on Katla. In, in earlier times, there are several cases of, of this. Uh, that both, uh, both volcanoes have erupted simultaneously or in close proximity to each other. What makes Katla particularly dangerous is the thick glacier on top. And uh, because Katla is very powerful, some of these eruptions can produce massive floods in the, at the beginning of eruptions. In the large eruptions, there, there have been really big lahars or, or mudslides coming down. So this is certainly one of the things that we worry about in Iceland. And this is the reason why Katla is really the, probably the best monitored volcano we have. Katla is more like, a, well, more like we can say the Santorini volcano. It has exploded, there's a big, big hole there that is full of ice actually uh, at Katla, so the ice is thicker, so there is more ice uh, volcano interaction that, that will occur. So the crater is inside the glacier? Yes, the crater is inside the glacier. It is how thick is the ice? The ice there is about 500 meter thick, so it is much thicker, much more water, larger floods, more denser locally, but it can eject more ash into the atmosphere. Η Ισλανδία είναι ένα νησί με 180 ηφαιστιακούς κρατήρες και 35 ενεργά ηφαίστεια. Είναι, με άλλα λόγια, μια χώρα πάνω στο καζάνι της γης που βράζει. Τα τελευταία 500 χρόνια, τα ηφαίστεια της Ισλανδίας έχουν βγάλει το 1 τρίτο της σλάβας που έχει έρθει ποτέ στην επιφάνεια του πλανήτη μας. Στο παρελθόν, κάθε φορά που ξυπνούσε το Αγιαφιάτλα Γιόκουντ, ακολουθούσε και μια έκρηξη στην Κάτλα, ένα γειτονικό και πολύ μεγαλύτερο ηφαίστειο. Οι Ισλανδοί επιστήμονες που εργάζονται σε ένα από τα καλύτερα και μεγαλύτερα ανοιχτά εργαστήρια της φύσης είναι πολύ απασχολημένοι τις τελευταίες μέρες. Και οι ερωτήσεις που δέχονται είναι πολύ περισσότερες από αυτές που μπορούν να απαντήσουν.
I need to take uh, water samples. I uh, that's my that's my uh, uh, main interest. That's water. the water, the ke chemical composition of the water. Mm -hmm. That's why I prepare all these bottles for the uh, farmers. It's really important to know the com composition of the water. The, the uh, sheep and, and the cattle is very sensitive to uh, fluorine, for example, in, in the water. Sensor. It's a gas sensor and it's it's fine, it's just uh, normal. But I can smell some some gases. So it's it's fine as long as we are we are just here, but it might be more concentrated if we go down towards into the uh, depression here. If it stays here, it stays in the same crater and pumps the lava down here, I think it would be the best if it would happen that way. But, but if it would stop, then fine. <laughs> but if it's going to move if to somewhere else within the glacier, that would be the worst. Because then you would have more uh, ash forming because of uh, magma, 
about uh, interaction, mm -hmm. and then we would have this free to magnetic uh, event again. And uh, the people down down here and the people all over uh, the world have had enough of us from this volcano. I have great respect for, for these mountains, but for me it it is like a, a naughty uh, friend, you know. <laughs> I have deep respect for it. It's like my aunt that be becomes really angry. <laughs> but it has an unpredicted behavior, let's say. Yeah, like naughty aunts. <laughs> It makes actually a lot of sense to make this connection between female and volcanoes in the same way that uh, it's kind of like the earth is reproducing itself. So like women, uh, something new comes from the eruptions. It's almost like the earth is having a baby. It's of course a lot of variety of legends and most of it is uh, what we would call a supernatural legends. But then of course we have also what we can refer to as uh, historical legends. First of all, we have this origin myth uh, which explain the volcanoes, how it, uh, why it started erupting and how it became into existence. Um, then, of course, we have some stories about uh, omens taking place before the eruptions. <laughs> Basically means the mountain uh, it's a glacier on a mountain which can be seen from Vestman Islands because uh, Vestman Islands are just outside uh, Eyjafjallajökull and from Vestman Islands you, this is the mountains which you actually see from the islands and that's why it's called Eyjafjall which basically means the island uh, mountains. Most of the geologists I actually know usually refer to it as the old man. The old man. Yeah, because it's so slow and uh, so uh, it's so few eruptions. You look really busy. <laughs> Yeah, I have to remember to mark everything correctly. <laughs> Otherwise, I will mix it all up. I'm filtering the sample I took down in, uh, in the river. And uh, since it has so much uh, suspended sediments in it, I, I would like to get rid of that to be able to see what is in the water itself. So I try to filter out all the suspended sediments. So this is the mud, or yeah, a little bit of grass. This is the mud that this came is the out mud. of the filter. Yeah. It needs several filters. It's so heavily loaded. So now you see there is a big difference in these two. This uh, is very, very clean. And this is very dirty. <laughs> and the difference is this one. The filter. The filters. <laughs> Yeah, I, I always hoped, of course, to have some action. 
not just sit by the desk all the time. I wanted to, to, to work in the nature, not just inside all the time. And that's what I do. I've done over the years I've been here in the institute. What I told the uh, farmers that have been uh, the most affected, well, I believe that this is not as bad as it could have been. The farmers are, of course, very uh, worried about the fluorine concentration in the drinking water where the sheep are so supposed to be drinking and the cows. I was not here when it started, but I came two days later and I was here when the asphalt came. It was uh, not so nice. It was uh, in the middle of the day. It was like in December, very dark. You couldn't see anything. My name is Guðni Thorvaldsson and I work now at the Agricultural University of Iceland. But my parents, they had this farm and we lived here for many years. But now we have uh, moved to Reykjavik, but we are still running the farm, but not with so many animals now as we, we used to have. We have uh, sheep and horses, only about 50 sheep and 40 horses. <laughs> We were uh, moving the rest of the horses to another place. Yeah, because there is no grass here and uh, the ash is dangerous. It in includes fluoride, which uh, is not so good for the animals. So we have to keep them away from the ash, at least until the fluor has washed away. Are you worried with the, with the volcano? Uh, I cannot say that I'm worried, but uh, because we have, uh, we can expect this in Iceland. We, we are used to it, but we know how dangerous it can be, so to respect these forces. Yeah. But it will stop someday. Yeah. How so long it, do you think it's going to last? I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> no. So we just have to wait. <laughs> Það var bara hérna hringt og við bara beðinum að, að fara af ríma svæðið vegna eldgós. Það var hérna, voru hérna, sáum eldgósi vel og, og hérna heyrðum aðeins í sko, eldingunum. En það er ekki fyrir ná föstudagskvöldinu sem að hérna, askan fyrir að svo læðast yfir á bæinn og, og það verður allt svart. Og við hérna svo sem hjöldum ykkur ró okkar og fórum bara að sofa en vöknum sem fjögur og nóttu og þá voru, voru húsi farið að nötra af eldingu. Ég var hrætt en börnin sváfu, þau urðu ekkit varðið þetta. En það er nú aðlega þeim ég er hrætt við eldingar. Og þess vegna var ég svona ósjálft hrætt. En auðvitað er allt í svarta myrkri og við sjáum ekki eldingarnar. Þá var þetta svona, hvað er þetta nálægt? Hvort það væri bara hreinlega að springa þetta fjall þarna fyrir ofan mig. Eða jökullin sko. Það er sem ekkert, sáum ekki neitt. So when you came back for the first time, after two days, what did you see? Bara svart, allt svo all jörðin svört. Og bara mjög dapurlegt að sjá enna heimilið algjörlega vera svona í hjúpu svörtum grum. Ég heiti Anna Björk Ólafsdóttir og hérna, ég er fætt og uppbælin hér á þessum, þessari, þessum stað. Ég á fjögur börn, það var 1996 sem ég hérna, eignast jörðina 
með, með manni mínum og hérna við hefurum eingöngu með kofi, mjölku framleiðslu og mjöldakjöts framleiðslu. Það er alveg jörðin sem er, er mesta tjónið er. Við munum ekki heyja neitt fyrir skemmtunar okkar þetta árið. Við vitum ekki hvenær þetta eldkurs endar og náttúrulega vitum ekki hvað, hvenær þetta verður í lagi, hvort það er næsta ár eða hvað næsta ég veit, við vitum ekki. Hvernig var þetta áður en askan kom? Grænt, allt grænt. Við hefðum grænkar fyrst hér á landinu og hérna, þá á alltaf að vera soldið sprottið með þessa grasið hérna, svona í byrjun mæði því við getum hafið heiskap svona viku af júni. When you see the smoke, you are still worried? Nei, þetta er bara eins og málverk hann að í bak við húsið. Have you heard the people talking about the Katla? Já. What do you believe? Já, hún gæti auðvitað gert hvað sem er. Það veit enginn. Þetta er auðvitað eldhjall. Στην Ισλανδία η ανησυχία για μια πιθανή ενεργοποίηση της Κάτλα επισκιάζει τη δραστηριότητα του σημερινού ηφαιστείου. Σύμφωνα με τους επιστήμονες, ο κρατήρας της Κάτλα έχει εμβαδό 100 τετραγωνικά χιλιόμετρα. Ο δε παγετώνας που βρίσκεται πάνω από τον κρατήρα έχει έκταση 595 τετραγωνικά χιλιόμετρα. Σύμφωνα με τους ειδικού, αν η λάβα συναντήσει τον πάγο στην Κάτλα, το νέφος της ηφαιστειακής τέφρας που θα δημιουργηθεί μπορεί να σκοτεινιάσει τον ουρανό της Ευρώπης. Μέχρι στιγμής πάντως, το σύννεφο της τάχτης από το Αιγιαφιάτ Λαγιόκουλτ έχει στοιχήσει στις αεροπορικές εταιρείες σχεδόν 2 δισεκατομμύρια δολάρια. Στον Βρετανό πιλότο Έρικ Μούντι ένα παρόμοιο σύννεφο παραλίγο να του στοιχήσει τη ζωή. Ήταν κυβερνήτη σε ένα τζάμπο της British Airways και είδε και τους τέσσερις κινητήρες του να στιματούν στα 37.000 ποδιά. Ég heiti Reynir Ragnarsson og fættur 1934 og flutti hingað östur 1943 með fórundrunum. Þá á þeim tíma varstu með þið utaðar um kvöldlu? Nei, það hafði ekki hugmynd um kvöldlu þegar ég kom hingað en svo fór maður að heyra sögur frá síðasta kvöldlu gosi og og síðan að lesa svona um eldri gos og sá hversu maður ætlaði ekki að trúa því og þegar sem eldri menn voru að segja manni þannig að manni fannst þetta eiginlega bara lýgansögur þetta var svo ótrúlegt ótrúlega lýsingar og ég hafði lýsingar frá fullornu mönnum sem höfðu lifað og voru hérna drengir í gosinu 1918 
Þetta var þetta var 12. október 1918. Þetta var ljómandi veður þennan dag. Svo ja, það byrjar með ske, einum skjálfta held ég. Vissi það var nú undafari var náttúrulega það voru engir skjálfta mælarar og búnir að vera víst er einhverjar hræringar og svo kom einn að þú skjálfti. Og svo bara í þessu góða veðri, setti bara dags, þá sluppu bátarnir voru þá alveg nýfarni. Þá, þá gauðs Katla. Ég var sjö ára og ég man verið fyrir því að það var alltaf ljós all, alla nætur og alltaf bjart inni því að það var lýsti svo mikið á jöklinum og alltaf saman í skrugugangur alla dag og nætur og þetta var ég hrætt við. Sex á sjöður og krakki. Það var alltaf saman ljós og gangur og aldrei, aldrei dimm. Ja, ég hafði ég, ég mér er þúst yfir þetta náttúrulega tilkomu mikið og og leið bara vel en það er gaman að sjá þetta. Varst ekki hræddur? Nei, ég var ekki hræddur. En hva hvenær er svo hljóp hún fram þennan þennan dag sko með náttúrulega fiknar fiknar flóði miklu. Og ef og fyrir vestan hjáls myndast langur tung, tangi út í sjó sem lengi var kallaður köttutangi. Það var myndið slangu af, af urframburði. Já. Og því þú sér hvað er kraftunum hefur nú verið mikill og mikill af urframburði. Er, er þjóðsaga, er kallað þjóðsaga? Já, ætli það ekki. Ég held að sé þjóðsaga. That story is about Katla. She uh, was a housekeeper in the uh, monastery, and uh, she had, of course, she was a witch, and uh, she had a very bad temper as well. And she had there was this uh, shepherd um, who was on the farm as well, and he suppo- his name was Bardi. He's supposed to take care of the sheep, and uh, Katla had this magical. The trousers and it has the uh, magical ability to uh, whoever wore it was actually able to run forever. So, and one ta- one time, Katla and uh, the rest of the people left for a wedding, and uh, he was supposed to gather the sheep uh, in the meantime, and uh, he stole Katla's uh, trousers because he saw he couldn't really get on the sheep in time. So, and that's how he was able to run forever and got all the sheep. But when uh, Katla came home, she noticed that uh, he had stolen the trousers and uh, of course got very angry and she killed him and stored his body. She sort of had to get rid of the body and hid it. So she noticed that uh, uh, Bardi was going to be found soon. And she was heard saying something like, oh, uh, Bardi will appear soon. And uh, because of she knew that she would be killed if uh, mm-hmm. she was found out. And then she suddenly ran to the mountain uh, where Katla is now, uh, to Myrdal's glacier, and uh, throwed herself in a crack in the glacier. Mm-hmm. And short time later, the first eruptions came in Katla, and the flood sort of took the monastery and the farmstead surrounding it. So it was thought to be Katla's revenge, and she was, of course, a very ill-tempered woman. So. Mm-hmm. Hvað hefur fjallið er að Katla er að koma upp alltaf á okkar hundra ára fresti eða svo? Já, oftast hefur hún gosið tvisvar á öld, já, tvisvar á hundra ára fresti. En það er aftur núna er, er orðið óvinnu langt og reyndar voru svona að þeir telja smá gos bara undir jökli eins, eins og 17, nei, eins og 1950 og Já, 56, 56 sem var það sem hann kom mikið, mikið vatn á austur hérna á sandinn. Og það er hérna fram að er steinn sem er köllum köllustein eða kötluklett og hann kom með 
Siesta nyt pieni temperatio. Getur sé hvernig hann hefur eiginlega álfur sóðist, hann hefur verið einhvers staðar nærri hita. Þessi við erum að keyra núna, er þetta ekki, er þetta sandur eða er þetta... Þetta er allt bara vikur sandur frá Kötlu. Þeir sögðu sko bara í síðasta gosi að þá töldu þeir að þessi sandur hérna alla leiðina yfir hefði hækkað um svona fimm metra. Þjóðurinn. Ja, ég tók ekki með mér skóflu, þannig að ég má nú ekki hætta á miklu. Ég átti ekki von að hann fara undan. Svona í öryggi skinni þá drep ég aldrei á bílnum hérna upp eftir jöklinum. Og ég vara fólk við hérna alveg við jökulinn að geta verið sandbleitur, isju, hérna alveg upp eftir. Það er að fara á eftir mér, ekki vaða á því hvar sem er, það er hættulegt. Ice cream, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> it's maybe, maybe maybe 300 years old water. Really? From the top of the glacier. Maybe it has fall down for 300 years ago. <laughs> but it's, it's okay to eat it now. <laughs> I felt that yogurt was like my brother, and uh, Katla was behind like my mother, because Katla was responsible for my birth. Oh. Oh, that's very simple. Uh, in 1918, there were no roads in that area. A uh, lot of rivers dividing people, dividing districts. But instead of uh, throwing themselves into the water and swimming to each other, uh, because of the bad times, all the ash falling from uh, the Katla eruption, they both simultaneously moved to Reykjavík. They were young people. And in Reykjavík, they met. And therefore, I was born. So she was telling me about this huge volcano, Katla, so enormously powerful, making uh, one or two hundred or three or five hundred greater floods than Eyjafjallajökull is. Would you like to see it dropping? Yes. Now you say I'm an irresponsible, but I'm not. Because we know that Katla has erupted uh, in 50 to 100 years intervals, uh, as long as we can see back in, the, uh, in history. So Katla is coming anyway.
Well, we were flying from Kuala Lumpur to Perth in Western Australia. It was a really dark old night and we'd crossed Java. I'd got out of my seat to go to the toilet and I was summoned back by the crew because they'd entered um, an area where they were experiencing a phenomena known as St Elmo's Fire. It was extremely attractive, very pretty, lots of colours of light shimmering up the windscreen. And then the first officer noticed that his two engines that he could see on his side of the aeroplane were lit up from within what would seem a very bright white light. Uh, so we were watching the pretty sights and then the, the engineer who sits between the two pilots said uh, number four engines failed. We shut it down properly as per uh, the book and that took 30 seconds. The, the engineer then said number two's gone, number three's gone, we've lost the lot. So there we were up at 37,000 feet out over the southeastern Indian Ocean on a really dark night with no engines going. We couldn't believe that all four engines had stopped. We needed convincing. Uh, we needed, our minds needed convincing because it, that does, just doesn't happen on a four-engine aeroplane. We just followed the start-up procedure that Boeing had in their manual for the start-up of four engines. And we did the whole procedure so many times and we uh, truncated that, we shortened the procedure to try and keep starting those engines all the way we, we were descending and I have no idea, we must have tried more than 60, 70 times on the way down uh, to get these engines going. When you address the passengers, what did you tell them? Well, I, uh, I believe in being honest with people and I, I thought, well, if I don't tell them what's happening, they're going to guess there's something going wrong, so I, I just tell them. And I said, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Eric Moody again. We have a small problem in that all four engines have failed. We're, we're doing our utmost to get them going. I trust you're not in too much distress. And would the chief steward please come to the flight deck? And for the next 16 minutes or so, we were struggling to get these engines going and we descended to just above 12,000 feet. It was a glide, we went 80 nautical miles forward, it doesn't plunge out of the air, uh, and for all that time, as I say, we were trying to get them going. We eventually did get uh, one going, then two, then four, uh, and um, we had lots of little minor dramas on the way down, and we landed then into Jakarta some 30 minutes later, not knowing why they'd stopped, and we didn't know why for two days. When you came down from the plane, did you kiss the ground? No, I didn't kiss the ground, but the flight engineer did. We had a suggestion after we'd been on the ground a little while that we'd been into a volcanic eruption. But it actually took two days before we got confirmation that we'd flown into a volcanic ash cloud. That's the crew in Jakarta. Before or after? After. Oh. That's just before we came home. If, if there's, a, there's the three of us. First officer, flight, uh, me, flight engineer. That's the back end of, oh. with the ash on of the aircraft. That's, be, that's the stator part of the turbine of, the, of the, one of the engines. Hero's a funny word, isn't it? Um, I was only interested in protecting that four inches of flesh, which keeps my head off my shoulders, my own neck, and uh, the f that everybody else was there um, was incidental to me at the time, thinking it through. And everybody deals with responsibility in a different way. And I've never felt a heavy responsibility because I wish to stay alive. And if I stay alive, 
everybody else does. As far as we know in the world, we were the first to do it and get away with it. We certainly were the first to recognise, uh, well, afterwards, what we'd done. And now every aircraft, uh, certainly commercial aircraft manual in the world, has a, um, a chapter on volcanic ash encounters, and it mirrors, apart from one thing they changed two or three years ago, it mirrors exactly what we did on that night. What would you advise the pilots? Well, to get out of it as soon as you get into it, because uh, nowadays he ought to recognise what's happening. We didn't know. We, we had no idea what we were into. But everybody now knows how to recognise uh, volcanic ash in the air. We have to study much better how ash is distributed. And this can only be done by measurement. So we have to invent new methods or uh, improve our methods to, to measure uh, ash in the atmosphere. Airplane engineers have to design better engines that are not so uh, sensitive to, to, to ash. In a way, uh, this eruption has been a very useful guide into the future. It's just the first uh, eruption that demonstrates our weaknesses. And uh, I think we should look at the, that in a, in a very positive way and, and try to improve our ways. Very large eruptions can uh, change the climate. They can even lead to, to climatic revolutions. The last confirmed eruption of this was the, the uh, Pinotupo eruption in the Philippines last century. Uh, there was a, a short uh, decline in temperature following it. This is more pronounced uh, at volcanoes that can eject as uh, high up in the, the stratosphere of the Earth, and um, volcanoes that are closer to the equator can do this more than volcanoes uh, at, at uh, high latitudes. There is uh, also the possibility that uh, a climate change can uh, influence volcanoes. Uh, especially volcanoes that are beneath glaciers. If you have a thick glacier on top of a volcano, mm -hmm. it will produce a certain pressure on the volcano. Volcano will adapt to that pressure, uh, but uh, if you then suddenly take the glacier away, you reduce the pressure on the volcano, and it will facilitate the eruption of the volcano. We have many volcanoes in Iceland. They are uh, a result of, uh, most of them are a result of what we call plate spreading. We are at a boundary between two major plates on the Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and in general, we have most geological activity at these plate boundaries. So here in Iceland, we have two plates, something we call the Eurasian plate and the North American plate. And they are diverging, they are splitting apart uh, about two centimeters per year. That is the same speed that the, the nails on your finger will grow, that is the plate movement in Iceland. And because of this stretching of ground, there is new magma generated in the mantle. In addition to that, we have something called a, a hot spot under Iceland. There is excessive upwelling of magma under Iceland. And when it hits the, the, the crust under Iceland, it forms about 35 volcanic systems. Είμαι ο Κώστας Φαλεγουρίνος, γεωλόγος ε, και είμαι εδώ στην Ισλανδία για 14 χρόνια και έχω ασχοληθεί με την ε, γεωθερμία και με τα γεωβερικά συστήματα πληροφοριών. Βρισκόμαστε στο Thinkfetlir, από γεωλογικής πλευράς, ο χώρος είναι πολύ ενδιαφέρον γιατί έχουμε εδώ πέρα το γίγνευσε της ε, διάνοιξη των οδηγιάνων πλακών. Ε, δηλαδή με λίγα λόγια, ε, έχουμε τη Μεσοκεάνιο ράχη του Ατλαντικού που ξεκινάει 
από την Νότια Αμερική θα λέγαμε, μέχρι και φτάνει μέχρι τον Βόρειο Πόλο. Ε, και εδώ το έχουμε αυτό στην επιφάνεια, όπου έχουμε την διάνοιξη των ωκεανών και εδώ βλέπουμε τις ρηγματώσεις ε, και τις λάβες οι οποίες υποδηλώνουν αυτή την δραστηριότητα. Είμαστε στον ωκεανό, εδώ είμαστε προς την πλευρά της Αμερικής, εκεί είμαστε προς την πλευρά της, θα είμαστε προς την πλευρά της Ευρώπης. Τα ηφαίστεια συγκεκριμένα όταν είναι κάτω από τους παγετώνες λόγω της θερμοκρασιών και της μακροχρόνης δραστηριότητα που έχει μια ηθιστική έκθεση δημιουργούν τίξη των πάγων και έχουν καταστροφικές συνέπειες λόγω των πλημμυρών που προκαλούν. Η κάθε βουλκανό είναι ένα πολύ βουλκανό and uh, we anticipate an eruption uh, sometime in next years or decades. Because of the eruption may have they will be evaluated that there is a, a, a somewhat increased probability of an eruption in the maybe next few years. Uh, however, we have no signs yet uh, of anything happening at Katla. Everything is calm, there are no earthquakes. We see no signs on our monitoring stations. We are, of course, taking into consideration the possibility that Katla could erupt. Mm -hmm. And the probability that it will erupt is probably higher now than it would normally be. But uh, we are monitoring the situation and, uh, and we don't see yet any indications of, of reawakening. Entrun sé bara entrun entrun lipni við entrun sé bara áfram sofandi. Ja, hún er sofandi eins og er. Langar að sjá aftur hvað þú gast. Nei. Hann gæri ekki sjá það aftur. Hún sjá það í þessu í sinni miklu tykk og slæma mafleiðingu. Ertu að þá að nota sjónaukan? Þetta, ég nota þetta. Þú nota þetta? Já, ég nota ekki þetta. Við sjáum ekki fórugt til þess að lesa eða skrifa. Og tapa það mikið til sjón. Það sé ykkur svona. Ég sé svolítið betur en ég myndi heldur í. Og hvað nota, á hvað ert þú að kíkja? Ég er bara að sjá hvað ég sé hérna úti, þetta í húsi og þetta sé fólk þar eða eitthvað. Maður er að sjá ekki kringur sig. Ég hef 7 children og 20 grandchildren. Þú kan sjá þeim á þeim pictures þar. Og hverju sem ég gerði þeim næsti ár nú er þeim fyrir þeim. I even have the next, the youngest one is two years old, and the first words he was uh, saying was, Mama, Papa, Ave Flua, Grandpa flying. If you see, he was just one year old, if he saw an airplane, Grandpa, Flua, flying. Very often fly over on Katla in beautiful uh, weather, looking at her because it's her. Uh, Katla was a woman there who walked into the mountain and uh, it's a revenge. She got by living at this mountain and making all this ash come over the people. And uh, so I speak to her very gently, please come, do it for me now. I, I'm, I'm ready, I have my camera and everything. Let's get it over with, because then you can sleep another hundred years. So, before your, your final farewell, you want to see Katla? I've, yeah, I've been dreaming about Katla for 60 years. She is a witch. She is the witch. She has this, uh, this uh, attraction. You know, uh, 
I'm not, uh, I'm not asking for a big eruption. Uh, some of the eruptions of uh, Katla have been smaller ones, uh, especially those who have come after the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull. But I, uh, I'm afraid it will be a pretty big now because Katla has waited so long. Katla has been waiting for uh, almost a century. Hello, Sibar, bless. Thank you.